Hello and welcome to my first lecture in thermochemistry under Alberta's Chemistry 30 curriculum. Um, today we'll give you introductory comments in thermochemistry. Um, here's a breakdown of the unit as I uh, will be delivering it. There's eight lectures followed by a review of all diploma questions. Um, here's a more important breakdown as far as um, I'm concerned. These are Alberta Learning's um, what are called knowledge outcomes for the unit. And you'll see there's uh, 14 of them. These are the knowledge areas the province wants you to master. Um, and more importantly, they form the basis for the bulk of the diploma exam questions that you'll see. John Dalton, the father of modern chemistry. He developed the first modern atomic theory, part of which was um, his uh, postulate that chemical reactions neither create nor destroy atoms. They simply rearrange atoms. Um, of course, his theory, um, and this part of his theory specifically, still holds today, a couple of hundred years later. It's an application of the law of conservation of mass. Um, we now know, he didn't know, but we now know that the rearrangement occurs when chemical bonds holding reactants together are broken and bonds creating products are formed. And we can see this illustrated below. Here we have a reaction between two water molecules and they're split to form two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. <coughs> Excuse me. If we think of this in terms of chemical bonds, we'll see that there are four hydrogen to oxygen bonds broken in the water, the reactants, and at the same time, one oxygen to oxygen double bond is formed, and two hydrogen to hydrogen single bonds are formed in the products. Um, and it'll be the, the, the it'll be the formation of, of certain bonds and the breaking of other bonds that the primary focus of this unit. Um, of course, the general rule is that an input of energy is required to break chemical bonds, while energy is released when a chemical bond is formed. Thermochemistry, then, is the study of energy changes associated with chemical reactions, as various bonds are being broken or formed. To do this work, we define system and surroundings. And the system is that part of the universe that is under our study, and that's typically the chemical reaction. The surroundings are everything else. Of course, we have open and closed systems. Open systems exchange both matter and energy with their surroundings. Closed systems exchange energy only. Um, it becomes important to refresh our understanding of the nature of energy. In physics, we define energy as providing the capacity to do work, and we quantify work as the application of a force through a distance, using the formula W equals F times D. In thermochemistry, we add a piece to this, and we say that energy gives a chemical system the capacity to do work, but also to heat its surroundings. Chemical reactions can transfer energy to the surroundings by either heating them or doing work on them. An example of the work component occurs when a reaction generates a gas end product. The chemical system does work as the gas pushes on the air around it. In, in the language of physics, we would say the gas being generated by the reaction applies a force through a distance on the air. Uh, thankfully, in this course, we can ignore any calculation of the work function and focus entirely on quantifying heat transfer. And we do so in a couple of ways. First of all, we deal with closed systems that don't release gas, or by treating the, uh, the work piece as a source of air, and we do a percent error calculation on that piece. However, the comparison between work and heat should not be forgotten. Um, in future chemistry courses, you'll be quantifying both. Um, for our purposes, though, work and heat can best be thought as, of as energy transfer processes, whereby energy is transferred from one place to another, typically from the system to its surroundings, or vice versa. Work involves the transfer of potential and kinetic energy on the macro level, while heat transfers kinetic or potential energy on the molecular level. Reminding ourselves of chemical bonds, they are a storehouse of chemical potential energy. It's caused by two factors. First of all, atoms have mass, and secondly, they're being influenced by a combination of, att of attractive and repulsive forces. So two atoms approach, and their protons repel one another, their electrons repel one another, but their protons and electrons are mutually attractive. And it's this combination of attractive and repulsive forces acting on the atoms that gives rise to chemical bonds. In this respect, an atom is analogous to a couple of systems, a bow being drawn back on, an, uh, rather an arrow being drawn back on a bow, 
or an object being raised above the surface of the Earth. Both of these are systems with mass and under the influence of a force. The arrow is under the influence of an elastic force. The object is under the influence of a gravitational force. And therefore both, like an atom, store potential energy. Of course, exothermic reactions proceed by releasing energy to their surroundings. Endothermic reactions proceed by absorbing energy from their surroundings. Uh, more importantly for our purposes, this is a quantitative relationship. The energy lost or gained by the chemical system is equal to the quantity of energy gained or lost by its surroundings. This is the statement that we layer the mathematics on top of in this unit. It's also an example of the law of conservation of energy, and it's fundamental to success in this unit. We quantify this expression using the following equation. The change in energy for the chemical system is equal and opposite to the change in energy for its surroundings. By way of example, if we take a candle, we can feel the energy being released by, the, by its combustion, but we know nothing about how much energy is being released. And here's the reaction. However, if we put a pot of water over the candle, we're very familiar with measuring the temperature increase in the water. And that temperature change is a direct measure of the increase in thermal energy of the water. And we can use it to calculate the energy gain of the water. We've done this in grade 10, and we've also done it, I believe, in physics 20, using the equation Q equals mc delta t. Um, at this point, we should remind ourselves uh, of the nature of thermal energy. Thermal energy is a form of kinetic energy. In the water, Thermal energy is the sum total of the energy of motion of the numerous water molecules in the pot. And again, there are a number of vibrational, rotational, and translational motions involved in this concept, just as there is both nuclear and chemical potential energy uh, within an atom. Temperature, by definition, is a measure of the average of the kinetic energy of the water molecules. And a change in temperature, by definition, is a change in that average kinetic energy. Hot water is hotter than cold simply because the water molecules are moving faster. Hopefully that's intuitive. In this unit, we apply the conservation of energy principle, and we say that the energy gain of the water above the candle must equal mathematically the quantity of energy lost by the candle. Finally, there's one step uh, further we have to go, since the candle uh, begins and ends the experiment at room temperature. Certainly some of the wax gets hotter for a time being as it combusts, but ultimately uh, the final temperature and the initial temperature are equal. Because of this, the candle wax has neither gained nor lost any thermal energy. Therefore, it must have lost some other form of energy. And, and as we've already said, chemical bonds store potential energy. And indeed, it's this potential energy that the candle loses as it combusts. Um, by way of overview, then, the entire setup converts the chemical potential energy stored in the, in the candle wax into thermal energy of the water molecules as they're heated. So that's the end of the uh, conceptual framework for the unit. I've got a few old exam questions we'll take up before I conclude. An open system differs from a closed system in that it, A, exchanges matter with its surroundings. Well, that's true, but is that the difference between the two? Um, in fact, I think that is. Let's look at our other choices. Um, it exchanges energy with its surroundings. Well, yes, it does, but so does a closed system. It exchanges neither matter nor energy with its surroundings. No, that's not true. It exchanges both matter and energy with its surroundings. Yes, that is true. But that's not the difference between an open and closed system. The difference between the two is that an open system exchanges matter with its surroundings and a closed system does not. It's a tough question, but the answer here is A. Temperature is a measure of A, the total kinetic energy of the particles in a chemical system, B, the average of kinetic energy of the particles in a chemical system, C, the total potential energy of the particles in a chemical system, D, the average potential energy of the particles in a chemical system. When you're dealing with, temp with temperature, you're measuring energy of motion. You're me measuring kinetic energy. And hopefully you recall that temperature measures, in fact, the average kinetic energy of the particles in a chemical system, B. In fact, A, total kinetic energy, is the definition of thermal energy, not temperature. 
The temperature of boiling water remains at 100 degrees Celsius as you heat it because. Yeah, this is interesting. You're heating boiling water, but its temperature doesn't go up. You're transferring energy into the water, but uh, uh, there's no increase in kinetic energy. Well, if kinetic energy is not increasing, then potential energy must be increasing. And in point in fact, the answer is B. You're transferring potential energy into the system. Which is true. Bond breaking requires the input of energy, while bond formation releases energy. And without getting any further, hopefully you recognize that that is in fact the correct answer um, from our notes. I believe this is our last question. The law of conservation of energy requires that the energy loss of a chemical system is equal to the energy gain of its surroundings. A. Well, no, that's not true. The energy loss of a chemical system has to be equal to and opposite the energy gain of the surroundings. So the answer is B. The energy loss of a chemical system has to be equal and opposite the energy gain of its surroundings. Yes, the answer is B. And that concludes the matter. I'll, I'll refer you to your, any homework your teacher would have signed, and I'll see you next time when I talk about heat transfer problems and get into some mathematics. Thank you.